Okay, so now we are going to talk a little bit more about humoral immunity. And here we have, we kind of divide it into two parts. One is, called, one is called active immunity and the other one is passive. Active means when the body produces antibodies, because remember in humoral immunity you have the production of antibodies. So an active immunity is when the body is producing the ad antibodies. And in passive immunity is when you're giving ready-made antibodies. So ready-made antibodies, which are also known as, if you remember, I said antibodies were also known as gamma globulins or immunoglobulins or also called immune serum. So this is often done when you want a quick response. You can't wait for the antibodies to be produced by the body. So you want something really quick, okay? So that's what is called passive immunity. One big difference is active immunity because the body is doing some work. Like it is producing antibodies. So it takes a while to manifest, but it's long-lasting. It's like the body thinks, you know, I've done all this work producing these antibodies, so it's going to remain with me for a really, really long time. And you remember this example we had in RH incompatibility. Say if a mother had an, or anybody, any positive person or any negative person is given positive blood and, you know, the cells begin to produce the antibodies, the anti-RH antibodies. Remember, in, in, in the mother, they remain for a long time if she's not given Rogam or anything. And what happens then when, the, when she gets pregnant the next time and if she is negative and the baby is positive, it can cause erythroblastosis fetalis. Can you see that? So that was one example you did earlier. So this is long-lasting. In passive immunity, because you're giving something ready-made, so it doesn't last very long. So this is short lasting. And I often love to give the example of if you buy your own car, you take good care of it. So you're like active because, you know, it's money that you spent and you bought. If your parents give you the car, you don't, you know, it gets dings and dongs and everything real fast. and doesn't last that long. Okay. Then... In both active and passive immunity, we have two types. One which is called naturally acquired and the other one is artificially acquired. So let's look at this example. So we're going to talk about active immunity first. So active naturally acquired is when you get some sort of an infection where you come in contact with the pathogen. For example, like, you know, you get infected with um, strep throat or you get measles, you actually suffer from the disease, you know, you come in contact with measles virus, or you get chicken pox. So what happens? The virus has entered your body, your body begins to produce the antibodies, and they remain with you, so you don't usually get infected the next time because those antibodies are present. So can you see this is naturally acquired? It's not like it's present in nature and you acquired it naturally, okay? And artificial, artificial active immunity is when you are actually artificially introducing the pathogen into the body, but not naturally you don't want to introduce the actual virus in its very virulent form. You want to change it a little bit, right? So what we usually do, this is done by vaccines or when you take shots, when you get vaccinated or when you get a shot, you know, like the flu season comes and you get a flu shot. So here you don't want to actually give the true influenza vaccine. Or let's say, you know, when you're in childhood, remember you go through a series of immunizations where you take uh, a measles shot, you take something for chickenpox later, you take something for tetanus, diphtheria, all these things. So there what they do is they take the virus or the bacteria and either they change it a little bit so that it is capable of provoking an immune response but does not cause the infection. So that is known as attenuated. Attenuated means to change it so that it can still provoke an immune response. So your body will, will produce antibodies, but it doesn't cause the disease in you. Or what, what we have is some vaccines which contain dead 
pathogen. So, you know, the bacteria or the virus will be killed, but it won't lose its uh, potency for provoking an immune response. You can have, have what are called dead and live vaccines. The live vaccines, usually the pathogens are attenuated or changed. So this is artificial because someone has to introduce it into you. It doesn't go into the body naturally. So once this pathogen is introduced into you, then your body begins to produce antibodies and, you know, you, you sort of uh, have immunity. Now, with flu, you would wonder, and this again, I said active immunity is long lasting. And then so some of you might have the question, what about flu? We need to take a flu shot every year. So why isn't that long lasting? Why can't we take a flu shot one year and be done with it for another 10 years? I mean, you know, you take a chicken pox vaccine, you take measles, mumps, rubella, you know, you take those shots and then you're done for a long time. The difference with flu is there are many strains of influenza virus. So every year they predict that these particular strains are probably likely to strike. So the vaccine is based on those strains. So what you took last year may not necessarily be the same strains that are going to be present this year. That's why you take an annual flu vaccine. Okay. So this is active immunity, natural and artificially acquired. And you think of it that way. When you're a child, you get you got vac vaccinated or vaccine, or you got shots. So these are the terms which we use for, you know, the artificial active immunity. Shots, vaccine, immunized. Okay, so these are some of the terms we use. Let's look at passive immunity. And again, it's naturally acquired or artificially acquired. Natural is something in the natural process. For example, all of us have uh, antibodies within us because we've come in contact with these pathogens at some point in life or we've been immunized. And then when women get pregnant, some of those antibodies can cross through the placental barrier and go into the fetus. And so when the child is born, that's why usually for the first three months, we don't need to immunize a newborn baby because they have these ready-made antibodies which have traveled from the mother. Also, the immune system is a little uh, immature at that time. So we wait for the immune system to get a little bit mature so that when we start giving them those vaccines, then they are able to produce the antibodies. So can you see that either they pass through the placenta or even through breast milk? And the, in breast milk, the first milk that comes out is known as colostrum. And this is very, very rich in antibodies. So they always tell the mother to begin nursing as soon as possible and that colostrum uh, contains a lot of antibodies. So that's how it is transferred. So you can see the, the child gets ready-made antibodies. It's through a natural process, you know, through the, be in the, um, from the uterus through the placenta uh, and nursing. These are natural processes. So this is a passive, naturally acquired type of immunity. Artificially acquired is when you give the person gamma globulin or immunoglobulin or immune serum. So imagine someone is bitten by a rabid dog. You cannot give them, you don't give them the rabies vaccine at that time because if you did, then it's going to take a long time for the person to form antibodies by which time they would die. Now what you want to do, you already know the dog is rabid. So what do you want to do? You want to give them antibodies immediately so that they can take care of the virus. Same for tetanus. You know, if someone contracts tetanus, the disease tetanus, it's produced by a bacteria. Again, you give them tetanus serum, which contains gamma globulin so that you can immediately take care of it. Okay. So this is artificial. So this is passive artificial immunity. So now let's look. I'm going to ask you some questions and see if you're able to understand which type of immunity it's going to be. So when you give Rogam, and we all did this when we were doing blood. So when you give Rogam to, a antibody, um, to an RH negative mother, what are you giving her? So you're giving her anti-D antibodies. So what are you giving her? Okay, so the correct answer is passive artificial immunity. Think of it this way. I said you're giving her antibodies. See this? The word, the 
operative word is antibodies you're giving her antibodies and whenever you give somebody ready made antibodies it's passive and because you're giving it to her it's not something which was naturally passed it's it's artificial so it's part passive artificial immunity okay look at this one when you take a flu shot like just went over it what are you acquiring So this could have been worded you are immunized against flu. So you know shot, vaccine, immunized, these are three terms that we use all meaning the same thing here. So what kind of immunity are you acquiring? Have you an answer? <coughs> yes, it's active artificial. So it's not active natural. See, you're getting the shot. If you got flu, then you acquire natural. You're, you're getting the shot. Someone's actually poking you and giving you the shot. So it's an artificial procedure. Okay, so it's active artificial immunity. Let's move on to, now we did finish with humoral, let's look at cell-mediated immunity. So remember, first and most important thing, it's a cell-to-cell -cell reaction. So in cell-mediated immunity, it's a cell-to-cell -cell reaction. So one cell, which is this T lymphocyte, will latch on to the infected cell and destroy it. So here an antigen has to be presented to the T lymphocyte. So cell mediated is carried out by T lymphocytes. The antigen has to be presented to the T lymphocyte. And it's usually presented by cells which are known as antigen presenting cells. So it's usually presented by cells known as antigen presenting cells. Normal body cells also can present it, but usually presented by an antigen presenting cells. And let's look at the main types of T lymphocytes and what they do. The cytotoxic T lymphocytes, often also loosely called CD8 cells, CD8 cells turn into cytotoxic T lymphocytes. These are the ones which actually carry out the cell-mediated immunity. These are the ones act which act do the actual destruction. <coughs> Helper T lymphocytes, they are called CD4 cells. CD4 turn into helper T lymphocytes. Helper T cells are very important because they actually stimulate the cytotoxic T lymphocytes to clone and carry out their function. They are actually, this helper T lymphocyte is one of the most important T lymphocytes present in the body. The helper T lymphocyte even makes the B lymphocyte clone. So it even stimulates the B lymphocyte. So it takes part both in humoral and, when I say takes part, it, it stimulates both hum humoral and cell mediated. In fact, in AIDS, which is acquired immune deficient syndrome, AIDS, so A-I-D-S. As the name suggests, this, is, this happens because of infection by the human immune deficient virus, immunodeficiency virus, HIV. What happens in this is that the virus goes and destroys this helper T cells. So when it destroys the helper T cells, no longer can the cytotoxic or the B lymphocytes be stimulated in order to clone and do their job. So that's why you get into a state where you have immunodeficiency, right? So that's why it's called acquired immune deficient syndrome. Here the immune system is deficient, okay? So that's, the, that's what happens in um, AIDS. The third type of lymph uh, T lymphocytes which are present are known as regulatory T lymphocytes or also called suppressor T lymphocytes which turn off the immune system when the job is done. You don't want it to kind of go into a hyperactive state. 
And then like the B lymphocytes, you also have memory T lymphocytes, which will re remember the antigen and bring about the response much faster. So let's see how cell-mediated immunity happens. And let's look at this picture here. There are two types of, if you remember, I talked about MHC proteins. There are two types of those MHC proteins. MHC class 1 type of protein. MHC1 is present on all body cells in the body, except for red blood cells, but it's present all body cells which have a nucleus habit. And MHC type 2 is present on those antigen presenting cells. If you remember, they were called dendritic cells and they were, you know, they were large macrophages and even certain B lymphocytes. So this is present on them. So don't go too much, don't sort of delve too much into this MHC1 and 2, but I just want to tell you the difference. So sometimes you'll see 1 and sometimes you'll see 2, so just so that you don't get confused. So like it, let's look at this picture here. So here is a dendritic cell, which is an antigen-presenting cell. A dendritic cell, an example of a dendritic cell is a Langerhans cell, which is present in the skin. It's a, like a macrophage. It's called dendritic because it has all these processes. So on its cell surface, it, what happens is it has engulfed a bacterium, it goes inside, and it processes the antigen of that bacterium and displays it on this MHC2 class 2 uh, protein. And it's displaying this. And it also has another molecule called a co-stimulatory molecule. So these are recognized by a helper T cell. So a particular helper T cell is able to recognize this. It was coded for this foreign antigen. And it also has its own co-stimulatory molecules, which kind of can interact with the ones presented by this dendritic cell. So this CD4 cell, what happens? It gets stimulated. When it gets stimulated or activated, it forms numerous clones. So it forms many more helper T cells and one of them will become a memory T cell which will remain to recognize that antigen later on. Then these helper T cells, they activate the cytotoxic T cell. Okay? So let's now go to the next phase. So the cytotoxic T cell has been activated. So here it was activated by the helper T cell because the helper T cell recognized that antigen presenting cell. So here it's almost like when you look here, this antigen presenting cell has, has got this antigen on its surface. It, so it's almost like it's telling the helper T cell, I've been attacked, do something about it. Because, you know, it's got that foreign antigen sitting on its surface. It said, I've been attacked, recognize the fact that I'm carrying this foreign antigen. You need to help me now. So that's why the helper T cells will go and activate the cytotoxic T cell. Now here, the cytotoxic T cell, there, I remember I said all body cells carry that MH, MHC1 protein, right? That one. So the MHC protein, if you remember, it can process self-antigen. So whenever self-antigen is displayed on the surface, lymphocytes leave it alone, right? They know that these are self-antigens. We shouldn't react with it. But let's say there is a, a cell over here which, whose MHC protein, which was MHC type 1, was carrying a foreign antigen on the surface. What will happen is it will display it. And here the cytotoxic T cell, which has been activated by that helper C cell, it will, it will go on that. And it'll, it'll, it's almost as if this cell is saying, look, I've got a foreign invader over here. Come and save me. Just take care of me. And you need to kill me because I've been invaded by foreign a foreign or uh, something foreign. So here you can see this helper T cell recognizes that foreign antigen which is present and it has numerous granules inside it. This cytotoxic T cell has numerous granules which secrete two substances. Perforin, we already talked of perforin when we were doing natural killer cells, they perforate. And another substance which acts very similar called granzyme. So it attaches to the target cell which was infected and it may, pokes holes inside the target cells and kills the target cell and then it leaves it and goes on to find other cells which carry the same type of foreign antigen. Okay, so have you followed this, how, how the cytotoxic T cell acts? So one, it is stimulated by the helper T cell and then it goes and attaches to the target cells which carry that foreign antigen. 
and it destroys them and then goes and latches on to any other cell which has that similar kind of an antigen. So here it's a cell to cell interaction and what ends up happening is there is lysis of cells. So here let's again look at this very important helper T cell. So this is how helper T cells will help in humoral immunity. So here's a helper T cell and here's a B lymphocyte. Remember antigen presenting cells, there were certain B lymphocytes which were antigen presenting cells. So here when this antigen presenting cell which happens to be a B lymphocyte is displaying that foreign antigen, the helper T cell recognizes it, it secretes certain chemicals which are which are stimulating in nature. Those chemicals are known as interleukins and in other places they are called cytokines. So it stimulates this. B cells get activated and they begin to clone and produce more B cells and you know remember of them most of them turn into plasma cells and the others turn into memory cells. So can you see it requires this helper T cell actually to stimulate that B cell in order to do the cloning. If the helper T cell is gone, cloning won't occur. So that's why your immune system becomes deficient. You'll have just one little cell which is capable of doing its job. Okay. In the same way, in, in the cell-mediated immunity, so here's a helper T cell which has interacted with that dendritic cell. And it, there's also that co-stimulating molecule. So it has to join at both ends, not only with the antigen, but with the co-stimulating molecule. It liberates cytokines very similar to these interleukins and then stimulates a CD8 cell which then clones and you know it's, it does its job of carrying out the cell mediated immunity. I already told you in AIDS so it's the helper T cell which is destroyed. In fact whenever they check when someone has HIV infection and they are checking they always see what is the CD4 cell level. How the level when the levels keep falling then AIDS begins to manifest, okay? So let's look at a review of humoral immunity and then cell-mediated immunity. The body's humoral or antibody-mediated immune response begins in the same manner as its cell-mediated response. But here, the macrophages are joined by lymphocytes, called B cells. The pathogen invades only those B cells receptor. These cells stand ready to end the battle. Meanwhile, the antibody macrophages activate those T cells. These in turn rendezvous with activated B cells. Treated by this meeting, helpers particles with B cells into rapid reproduction. Some B cells become membranes, ready to respond to a later invasion by the cell, but most become antigen producing factories called plasma cells. Freely circulating in the body, antibodies dock with pathogens. This neutralizes them or marks them to by weapons in our immune arsenal. Acted. White cells phages lead the body's cell-mediated immune response by engulfing and digesting foreign invaders. Combining fragments from the invaders with some of its own proteins, the macroche builds a patchwork of antigen complexes on its surface. When smaller white blood cells called helper T-cells encounter the macrophage, those with matching receptors bind the surface. These helpers then multiply and see chemicals which call different cells to battle, especially the cytic or cells.
the macrophage or its cell. Activate only cytotoxic cells with receptors that match the antigen complexes. From the helper T cells rapidly divide into an army of clones, all designed to fight the specific that triggered the response. When killed with an infected cell, they bombard it with lethal toxins, then move on and search other targets. So let's look at innate and adaptive immunity. Actually, before we do that, so since this is a uh, in cell mediated immunity, this is a cell to cell type of reaction. So you see it in areas where a virus is not present in the extracellular fluid, but a virus has gone inside the cell. So when the virus has already infected the cell, then this, then these antigen presenting cells or even the regular cell will throw off that flag to show that I have the virus inside. And then that's when the cell mediated immunity will be there so that the cell is destroyed. Or you can take it when you have transplants, you know, like tissue grafting or organ transplants, because again, it's a cell it's from somebody else's body or, or tissue when you're doing grafting, if it's from someone else's body, when there's a graft rejection. So again, it's a cell-to-cell -cell reaction where the graft is rejected. So you can see that that cell-mediated immunity takes part in these kind of reactions, okay? So here, let's look at innate and adaptive immunity. So it, as I said right at the beginning, it isn't as if your body can only do this or that. It's one or the either. All the systems kind of work together. Sometimes it so happens that the innate immunity might help right in the beginning, and you may not even have to call upon the uh, adaptive immunity. Sometimes you may have to call upon it. So let's look at this. So let's say the antigen uh, gets into the body. So it triggers these innate responses. First, there's those surface barriers, and then there are the second line of defense. So they, you know, so that's what happens. Then if it takes care of the problem, well and good. If not, you, it might find, the body might find, oh, I need to kind of gear up some more of my forces. So the adaptive immunity is also called into play. This begins to, if there are free antigens which are present, they activate the B lymphocytes which clone and form plasma cells and antibodies are formed. Those antibodies circulate and they may form antigen antibody complexes. And or they may also, if you remember, they can go and stimulate a helper T cell. If the problem is taken care of over here, that's fine. But what if at this point, let's say this was a virus which was lying free, now it begin, it has gone and entered into a cell. So then these dendritic cells will capture that, they will present it, they will activate helper T cells, which in turn will activate the cytotoxic T cell and they will take care of the job. So at any point, the more severe the infection, all forces are called into play. If the infection is less severe, automatically, you know, not so many. You don't need to call all of these uh, uh, these things together. Okay, so I hope you understand that they can all act together. The idea is to make your immune, sy uh, immune system respond and take care of whatever pathogen comes into it. When the immune system fails, so it's trying to, but when it's failed, when it's besieged by pathogens which it cannot take care of, then you manifest with the disease. Okay, so many times you may have a streptococcal infection which you don't even know because your body is taken care of it. When you do get a strep throat, it is because all of this came into play but your body couldn't take care of it because maybe the infection was so virulent or the, the numbers were so great. So that's when you manifest with the disease. Okay. So let's look at this. Let's answer this question.
I need one more. Okay, mismatch transfusion. Yes, remember, again, you can't forget what you've done before in blood transfusions. Remember, it was antibodies which were produced. Remember the antibody, if you had A group and you gave that to B, a person with B group, remember the anti-A antibodies. So it is mismatch blood transfusion, which is humoral in type. All the others, I, which I mentioned earlier, a body's response to cancer cells, in one I didn't tell you that, but the cancer cells also, so it destroy cancer cells, Virus infected cells or graft rejections or transplant rejections, these are all examples of cell mediated immunity. So let's look at this. Let's do a bit of review. What will happen if helper T cells are destroyed? Okay, the correct answer is the cell-mediated immunity will, oh, oh sorry, uh, helper T cells, yes, the immune, I thought it was, the immune system will not be affected, that's right, that's correct, the immune system will not be affected because remember the helper T cells are the ones which stimulate both cytotoxic and B lymphocytes, so that's what happens in AIDS, okay, cell-mediated immunity will suffer if the, for example, the T lymphocytes were destroyed all of the T lymphocytes. So in the helper T cells help both. So it's not only um, uh, cell mediated, but also humoral. So that's why the immune system will not be effective. Okay, let's look at this one. What's the difference between autoimmunity and AIDS? Okay, the spelling here is wrong. And I want everyone to answer. If somebody's is not working, or Okay, the correct answer is the last one. One is breakdown of the recognition apparatus and the other one is a po poorly functioning immune system. Uh, it's not that the immune system is not developed in autoimmunity. It is that in autoimmunity, the immune system cannot recognize self. So that's why the recognition apparatus is breaks, breaks down. So immune system begins to attack its own, own cells. And in AIDS, it's a poorly functioning immune system. Let's look at another um, and last part of immunity, which is allergy and hypersensitive reaction. And you all have, um, anyone in this class has uh, any kind of allergy? What kind of allergy do you have? Everything. To everything? Um, primarily environmental, um, like uh, dust mites. Dust mites, okay. And then during the, um, you know, like during spring when the flowers and trees are kind of blooming to get like, you know, the seasonal allergy for you, for you. Okay. Uh, and anyone else? You don't, but what, what are you allergic to? Okay. Um, anyone allergic to like shellfish, um, you know, things like that, you know, people are allergic to all kinds of things. And the more we come in contact, the more these things become, uh, complex and you know the more processing goes on you kind of change little things and and that kind of creates you know makes us allergic to them so let's see how allergens um, allergens actually bring about the response 
So the first is the allergen is actually an antigen. So again, it could be part of something, it could be a whole thing, and all kinds of things like dust mites, um, hay, and that's how hay fever got its name because they found in England in the barns the hay was being stored and people, were, you know, it would be damp and moldy and people started getting um, uh, allergic responses to that. Uh, pollen is another thing. People are allergic to shellfish. Some people are allergic to eggs. Peanut allergy is a big thing. You know, everybody knows about that, right? So what happens is that the allergen is present in nature. It invades your body. And so the plasma cells, um, you know, the B lymphocytes, they kind of uh, recognize it. They clone, they form plasma cells. The plasma cells releases uh, antibodies. The class of antibodies is IgE. And these antibodies, what they do is they go and attach to mast cells and even basophils. The mast cells and basophils, if you remember, they contain granules of histamine and heparin. So they've attached here, can you see, to the mast cells. So this is the first stage, sensitization stage, and you don't know about it. The second response is that you come in contact with the same allergen again. So now the, it enters your body. So then it com this antigen combines with those antibodies which have been which are present on the surface of those mast cells and when they form that antigen antibody complex it triggers off degranulation so these mast cells and basophils they release histamine and heparin and these then circulate in the bloodstream histamine and heparin heparin is an anticoagulant and also histamine tends to dilate the blood vessels so blood vessels everywhere in the body get dilated when they dilate, especially in areas where there is a lot of connective tissue present, they are, because they are dilated, more blood is flowing. So it's like an inflammatory response. So fluid seeps out and it goes into the surrounding tissues. So think of areas which get affected. Your nose feels very stuffy when you have an allergy because the nasal mucosa is, is, is very vascular and has also a lot of connective tissue. So, you know, your nose gets stuffed. Your eyes begin to tear. So again, glands are stimulated. They begin to pour out secretions. They even swell because, again, connective tissue is very, very loose. In your gastrointestinal tract, in the areolar tissue of the gastrointestinal tract, that also gets affected. So all of these areas, the bronchi, the blood vessels, or small respiratory passages, this histamine causes constriction of them. So you sometimes people choke. They have what is called an anaphylactic reaction which is why you have to give them, in such cases, you have to give them epinephrine because epinephrine is a very powerful bronchodilator. So because these respiratory passages are becoming closed, you give them something to open it. So epinephrine, which is, acts like the sympathetic nervous system released you, um, at sympathetic nerve endings, so you, give, you give them you know, outside epinephrine, not from the body. And um, that helps, helps them to breathe. So this is what happens in allergy. Uh, so initial is a sensitization stage, which you may not even be aware of. And then a subsequent secondary response makes it really bad. And so people have to keep away from them because the more you kind of come in contact, it's possible that the second and third and fourth time the reaction could get even worse. So let's look at a little video on this. Normally, your immune system helps protect you. It does this by sending in special cells, proteins, and chemicals. Bacteria or other harmful substances invade your body. This response helps realize the forces. But there are many things that enter your body that the immune system uses as harmless. This can include things like pet hair, dust mites, and tree pollen. In a person with allergies, the immune system mistakes these harmless substances, known as allergens, for potential threat. The first time the immune system sees an allergen, it reacts by activating special cells. These make large amounts of proteins, called antibodies, that are specific to the type of allergen. These antibodies then attach to other This time the allergen enters the body, these sensitive immune cells quickly attack. They 
attached to the allergen, which causes a release of natural chemicals, including his. These chemicals end up surround you and cause many of the symptoms of allergies. A person with bronchitis, which affects the nose and eyes, sneezing, an itchy, runny nose, and red, itchy, watery eyes can result. Two to four hours later, another response begins as more immune cells become activated and release their chemicals. These chemicals cause inflammation, swelling, and congestion in areas. This is why the allergy is actually a harmful substance or fish, or dust mite, or something. It is because the body kind of overreacts. So it goes into panic mode, which is why it's known as a hypersensitive reaction. So here, this is where the immune system has become hypersensitive. So it overreacts to it. Okay, so it's kind of gone above and beyond what it should be doing. So that's that's a very important thing to remember about allergy. It's an overreaction by the immune system or panic mode. It goes into panic mode. Okay, let's do a little review of a few things we did earlier. What is the mode of activation of interferon? So remember, interferon was one of the first, uh, second line of uh, defense, and it was in non specific immunity or innate immunity. NKC stands for natural killer cells. Okay, the correct answer is A and B. It prevents replication of viruses and also activates natural killer cells and macrophages. Okay, if, th if the thymus did not develop at birth, which type of immunity would be compromised? Very good. Cell mediated, because that's where T lymphocytes become immunocompetent. Okay. How about complement proteins? Yes, very good. And what class of immunoglobulins immunoglobulin is liberated in an allergic response? <laughs> IgE. Excellent. <laughs> 